Hello everybody, I'm Nick and this one I'm going to introduce you to five open source projects that I believe deserve more attention. Now there are some rules and I have to lay them down for you. First and foremost, the project needs to be .NET related. This is a primarily .NET channel, I want to help my community. Second, it has to have around 500 stars on GitHub or less. Third, it has to be free, at least on its basic tier and maybe have an enterprise um, a bracket, but maybe for big companies. Then it has to be active because I don't want people to just abandon it. So it has to show at least two months of activity. Uh, and last but not least, its main developer has to pay me. <laughs> I'm joking. All you need to do is either leave a comment in this channel with your favorite project. Please don't leave links because YouTube will block them. So just use the GitHub um, first bit and second bit, the project name, to let me know what the project is. Or message me on Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever you want. Just send it over and I will put them in the backlog and make another video like this one. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you're subscribing and the notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. But before I move on, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, the NDC conferences. Now, many of you reach out on Twitter and LinkedIn and you ask me, hey Nick, how are you finding ideas for your videos? How are you learning all those things you're showing and how can I learn them as well? And the answer is always, I'm attending conference talks. Now, previously in person, now online, and hopefully in the future or the very near future in person again. My favorite one to attend as a .NET engineer are NDC conferences. In case you don't know, are conferences that happen around the globe, mostly focused on .NET, but other tech as well. And they happen every year. The biggest one is in Oslo. There's one in London, which is pretty big. There's one in Sydney, in Porto. And you can click on the website and the link down below to check them for yourselves. Now, just to understand how influential those talks are, Blazor was a talk given by Steve Sanderson in NDC. John Skitz abusing C Sharp is an NDC talk. Jimmy Bogart's Domain Driven Design at the Good Parts is a talk in NDC. And the legendary The Art of Code by Dylan Beatty is also an NDC talk. So you can understand how much value you can get out of an NDC conference seeing these experts giving these talks. This year I will be in NDC Oslo and NDC London. So if you want to come meet me, come watch these talks with me. Please click the link in the description, sign up buy a ticket. You can also get your employer to buy the ticket for you. This is what I've done in the past. And let's have a beer. So the first project I want to show you is called N Bomber. And N Bomber was made by Antol Moldovan. Now, I'm going to destroy pronunciations in this video. So sorry if I butchered your name, but I do want to put the name forward because I do think the developers should be on the spotlight for working on an open source project. Now, what is NBomber? Remember a few weeks ago when I made a video about K6, a load testing tool that you write JavaScript and then a Go thing runs it in the background? Well, this package, NBomber, is written in F-sharp and it is a load testing tool as well. And it's really, really cool. Like, you can do a lot of the stuff you can do with K6, but you can do all that with .NET. And the cool thing about it is it's technology agnostic, meaning you don't have to only load test a web application or a web server. You can wire up a database test straight into this and just hit the database without having to go through an HTTP request and then see what your database can do. It's really, really cool. And this is, for example, how I would describe a test where I'm calling the YouTube endpoint and it accepts a cancellation token over here. And then if the status code is good, I'm saying, okay, if it is bad, I'm saying fail in the response. And I describe a step here. And then I have the scenario builder and I describe my scenario using my step. So a simple HTTP step here. And then I have a warm up duration for five seconds. So for five seconds, I'm gonna be firing requests. And then I have a simulation or simulations. And I'm gonna load one, for example, this one is inject per second. And what this will do is it's gonna send 100 requests per second for 20 seconds on that API. And at the end, it's gonna collect all the data and show them back to us. But let's show all that in action. So I'm gonna run this API, which is in the helpers directory. And all it really has is it returns uh, a subscriber count. This is a static number. And then I wanna just low test that endpoint with 100 requests per second, and let's see what that looks like. I'm gonna go here, and all I'm gonna do is we're gonna say .NET run. And this has a beautiful UI. You can see it updating in real time. You can see what step you are in. It's gonna initialize the client first. Let me just move this here so I don't hide it. Then it's gonna do the warm up, which is what we instructed it to do with the rate we instructed it to do so. And then it's gonna start bombing, meaning sending the request in the load manner that will define in the simulation. It's gonna run for 20 seconds. Now this is done. And as you can see, it's collecting all the data. It's telling you a few details here, which is very useful if you're just looking at the console. But what it's also doing, and this is really cool, 
is it's generating a report and I can go here and as you can see I have one which is an HTML file so this I can open in my browser let's see what that looks like and this is what that website the report generated looks like it gives you the session name the testing suite you can see some details on the environment so you can see uh, how many calls my system have and all that and where I'm from um, then you can see all the stats so we had uh, because we run it for 20 seconds we have uh, 2100 requests all okay 105 rps or requests per second and then i can see more details here um, a latency distribution over time it has some really cool metrics you can see throughput latency hints and all that and what i'm going to do before i move to the next tool is to actually show you what it looks like if you want to spam it a bit more so i'm going to have 16 uh, effectively threads spamming the api in a load testing manner in a stress testing manner to see how it performs so i'm going to go back in this clear it and do dot uh, net run and let's see now how this works so test has started and you see this copies name this is effectively threads so it's going to run for the full 20 seconds and we're going to see how it performed test is done results are back i won't bother opening the uh, ui again but you can see that all of the requests passed and we have almost a million requests in 20 seconds uh, through 16 copies, I think of them as threads. And you can see that the total RPS request per second was 47,000. Pretty good. So that's a moment for you. I mean, this is a given for the video, but please go and give a star to every single one of these projects if you think they're cool because they can use all the attention they can get. Moving to the next tool. Now, this is a very interesting one because this tool is not like a NuGet package or something you'd have in your UI. This is something I personally use a lot and it's called C Sharp Repl. C Sharp Repl has 300 stars and it's made by Will Fokwa. Fok <sighs> I'll put it on the screen by, by this name. And look how cool it is. All you do is you install it as a CLI tool. And once you have it, you can globally access it. So what I can do now is I can enter C Sharp Repl mode. So how many times did you wanna run some quick code but you didn't want to create a console app to do that quick code to see how it evaluates. Well, all you do now is you do C Sharp REPL and you are in that C Sharp REPL mode. And now I can do things like, well, write C Sharp. So console and I have autocomplete. Look how awesome that is. Great UI. It is using Spectre console behind the scenes for the console, by the way. And then I can do just write line and hello world looks like this. So hello world. Here you go. It just printed hello world. And it doesn't stop there. You can do var x equals 6, var y uh, equals 9, and then you can do something like console. Autocomplete is so cool in the console. I cannot believe how awesome that looks. I can say um, x plus y, and I can print 15. So I can run multi lines of code. I can run a lot of stuff in here. And the reason why I'm raising it is because, like I said, the use case I always have is I want to run some code or someone said something and I want to evaluate how valid that is real quick. So now I don't have to go through a console app. All I do is I have this tool installed and from anywhere I enter this mode and I have all C Sharp and Autocomplete on my fingertips. It's so, so cool. Please go ahead and give it a star. The next project I want to show you is called Verify. Verify has 400 stars on GitHub and it's made by Simon Crop. Now, Verify is interesting because you might not know the concept that it tries to tackle, but I'm going to try to explain really, really quickly. So let's say you have the following unit test here. You have some repository you want to test, and then you want to test the get by ID uh, method. And you send it the ID that you want to test, and then you get some results back. Hopefully you have them uh, mocked or you have it in like in memory generated or in memory stored deterministically. And all you want to do is in a very controlled way, you want to assert the value from the thing that you're testing and the value that you know from beforehand. For example, I want to know that Amy's name is the person given name in this object and this variable. Same with a variable name and same with any other property that I'm trying to assert. So this is your typical unit test and you're asserting against something in a very controlled manner. Now Verify is tackling the subject of snapshot testing. What is snapshot testing? Well, very quickly, you have a form of testing that runs, generates some result. You look at the result, you're like, oh yes, I'm happy with that result. Use that as a harness. And then every time that test runs again, the output of the test is compared to that original thing that you said, 
that looks good. And if something changed, then the test fails. It's way easier to explain when I run this test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this test. That's what a snapshot test looks like. You have some settings because I want to ignore a variable. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to test the exact same method, the get by ID method. And I'm going to verify that the person coming back from that is the right one. Now, I haven't run this test before. So look how this behaves when you haven't run a test before. I'm going to run the test. Now, the test looks like it's failed, but actually verify opened this window for me, which is effectively a diff compare. So this is the file. This is the content. This is the output of that person object here. This thing is in that file. Now, because this is the first time we have to take a look at this and we have to say, oh, you know what? I'm very happy with the, this output. I, I think it's great. What I'm going to do is I'm going to paste it here in this verified.txt because I verified the output of this test. And now from now on, since I saved it, and you can actually see it here in this verified file, every time the test runs again, it's going to generate a received.txt and a verified, and it's going to compare it against that saved verified. Your verified one, you want to push into version control. You want it to be checked in. The received one, you want to ignore. You don't want to check it in in your repository. So I'm going to delete that, and this is what it would normally look like for me. So. How does the test now work? Well, if I run it again, since I said, oh, that's a verified file, I'm happy with this output, I'm going to run it again, and the test now will pass because the file generated, which is now automatically deleted, by the way, is matching my verified.txt. Now, if something changes in my code, and if I go in that repository where I have some data and Emmy becomes M, or something else changes that wasn't expected, then when I run this test again, look what happens. It's going to fail. Windows going to open. And it's going to show me exactly what changed. And now I come here and I can judge whether this was a regression or this was expected behavior. And I need to update the verified file to have the new changes. In this case, it's not. So I'm going to go back, close it, reverse that change, and then rerun the test. And hopefully it will pass. It's a very interesting concept and I will make a dedicated video on it because I do think it's very interesting and it has many use cases. But for now, just know that this is a great package. Go and give it a star. I can totally see this being usable in a real life scenario. Next, we have Fluent Docker with around 300 stars made by Mario Tofia. Now, Fluent Docker I've shown before in this channel. I use it a lot because I'm doing a lot of automation and it's really, really handy. It allows you to control things like Docker services, containers, use Docker Compose and all that from C Sharp. It wraps around it. And why is it so cool? Well, because when I'm running acceptance tests, for example, or integration tests or some other form test that requires the website to be operational, I have usually a Docker file and Docker Compose and I call that, run the test and tear it down all part of my continuous integration workflow. An example of that I've shown in this video in my Specflow video when I talked about acceptance testing. Specflow has this thing called hooks, which is something happening before and after the test. And what I'm doing before the tests is I'm spinning up Docker, running the tests against a real API and then tearing it down over here by disposing it. And actually, I'm going to run it just to show you how it works. There's nothing running in Docker right now. So when I click run, um, this will, as you can see, create the containers using Docker Compose, a database and a web API. This is all done with Fluent Docker controlling uh, the Docker Compose. It's really, really cool. Tests pass. Now it's going to just automatically tear it down. I'm not doing anything here. And it's going to dispose it eventually. Uh, yeah, exited and gone. So that's how I'm using it. And this is a very quick example of how you can use it. You have a user container, use Docker Compose. I have a file here. This is going to create a MySQL database. I can just run this and then it's going to wait for 20 seconds and then dispose it. So as you can see now, it just created this database. You can see it here, all running. And then after 20 seconds, it's going to tear it down. Yep, gone. Great. So that's Fluent Docker. Please go give it a star. Great project, great product, long time active, highly recommended. Last but certainly not least, we have Capboard, a new project by Patrick Svensson, the guy who made Cake, uh, Spectre Console, a bunch of other projects. And Capboard is a relatively small and niche project, and it has to do with mostly provisioning your local environment in a desirable state. And how it does it is why it's very interesting. 
Now, Cupboard is fairly new. It's only been out for two months and it has 69 stars on GitHub. But um, I'm going to show you how it works. So what I have here is a program.cs and then I create my Cupboard host and then a builder and then I specify a catalog. And that catalog has in it um, manifests. So it has some facts, for example, it checks whether this machine is Windows. And if it's not, yeah, then it doesn't run it because this is a Windows specific thing. By that, I mean the specific thing I'm provisioning. I'm provisioning my Windows machine. That's why it's not supposed to run on Linux. And then um, I'm saying use this manifest called uh, Chocolaty. In case you don't know, uh, Choco is um, a way to install things in your PC without having to go through installers. It's all console based. And once you install that, you can install a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then your manifest looks like this. You have an execute method and you say download this partial script to this file. That's how you define your manifest. Then you say set an execution policy so you have elevated uh, access to install things. Uh, then you say install something using PowerShell. So you point to the script, you give it a name, you specify some rules if you want to, then you set the policy using the registry key, and then you download this install script. And then once you have Chocolate installed, you can use anything that works with Choco, for example, VS Code, and then you ensure it's installed, and then you're done. You say you install Chocolate. So that's how you can define basically anything that you want. It has all the basic building blocks to go crazy if you want. Let me show you exactly how that looks in a fresh machine here on this VM. So I've published this exact code and it's all here. And all I need to do is say cupboard example.exe. I'm going to run that. And then you see this nice UI and then ask you, are you sure you want to run it? Yes, I am. And once you say yes, you can see exactly what it's going to do, by the way. Uh, register key stuff, download the script, install chocolatey, and then um, use chocolatey package to install VS Code. So hopefully after this, oh, and by the way, let me just show you this. I do not have, um, these are so white. I do not have Visual Studio Code installed here. So I'm going to run this and you can see what it's doing, downloading this, downloading that, installing it. Um, let's wait for it to finish. So now it's installing VS Code. Hopefully you'll see the little icon pop up on the desktop in the background. Once it's done installing, here you go. That easy. It installed Chocolatey, it installed VS Code. You can install anything you want using that. And now I have VS Code on this machine ready to run. It's very, very cool. I highly recommend you use it. Uh, the main reason why I put this video is because I do want Patrick to keep working on it and make it more flexible. Um, so go give it a star, uh, make it move past 69. And hopefully this can be a very nice project we can all use to provision our local machines. That's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my patrons for making this video possible. If you want to support me as well, you can find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.